Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the sixth annual SSEP National Conference here at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Uh, my name is Jeff Goldstein. I'm the center director for the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education. And I am the director for the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. Uh, we're looking forward to another wonderful day of student researcher presentations at your own research conference. And I think we've got a special treat this morning. Uh, starting off the day is uh, a featured presentation by Dr. Don Thomas, NASA astronaut. Um, Don was on four space shuttle flights, STS-65, STS-70, STS-83, and 94. And so with that, I would like to welcome to the stage astronaut Don Thomas. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody? Hey, I'm really excited to be here. As you heard, my name is Don Thomas. Had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. I spent a total of 44 days up in space, and I went around the Earth 692 times. So I can stand up here and confidently say, I have seen your hometowns wherever you're from. It was a really amazing experience. My background, I'm one of the mission specialists, one of the science astronauts. I got a bachelor's degree in physics and then my master's and doctorate in engineering. Uh, went on to become a mission specialist. Three of my four missions were space lab, science flights. So I worked on many different experiments, hundreds of different experiments from researchers across the country and around the world. Many of the experiments are ones similar to what you're performing now. I also worked as the International Space Station Program Scientist for about three years. And I was the one uh, responsible for coordinating and scheduling all the student experiments and all, all the science experiments up on the ISS. And I, I tell you, I really enjoyed the student experiments more than any other ones. And so I'm very supportive of, of your program here and the experiments that you've flown and ones that you will fly in the future. So with that, I want to go ahead and tell you a little bit about uh, my experiences here. I always start with this picture. This isn't a picture of me, but it very well could have been me. I was six years old when the first American astronaut launched into space, and you can tell by looking at me, it's been a while since I was six years old. It was like 55 years ago. And back then, at my elementary school, they brought us all to the gymnasium one day, and we watched the launch of the first American going into space. May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard launched into space. I watched that on a small black and white TV at my school, and as soon as that launch was over, I said to myself, I want to do that. So ever since I was a little boy, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut, wanted to go into space, I wanted to experience zero gravity, and I wanted to see sunrises and sunsets with my own eyes from space. So I knew what I wanted to do. The problem always is, well, how do you get there? How do you get from point A, I want to do something, and point B, you're actually doing it. And as a six-year-old boy, I had no idea how to become an astronaut. We didn't have any space camps back then. There were only seven American astronauts at that time, and I didn't know any of them. Uh, but one thing I recognized early on, it was going to be tough. There's a lot of competition. So I thought the only shot that I'm going to have at ever going into space would be by working hard, doing my best in school every single day. And that was my, my strategy. And, you know, in elementary school, I was an average student, got mainly Bs, a few Cs, a few As. Uh, in middle school, I started working a lot harder, and I was getting As and Bs. By the time I got to high school, uh, I was working really hard on my schoolwork and got nearly straight A's. I had one B in high school. And I got those grades not because I'm the smartest guy in the world, but because I worked really hard. I've got a fraternal twin brother who's like a genius. He never had to study at all, and he got straight A's like that. And some of you are probably those kind of students, or you know students like that. I was one of those students that had to read that chapter, read it again, go talk to my teacher. But in the end, I got it. I learned everything I needed to learn, and I also learned how to work hard along the way, which was an incredible, valuable uh, resource for me later on in my career. After high school, I went to Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, where I grew up, got my bachelor's degree in physics, and that's a minimum degree. You need to become an astronaut, four-year college degree in math, science, engineering, or the medical field. But again, I knew that competition was going to be tough, so I decided to stay in school and I went to Cornell University and ended up getting my master's and then my doctorate in material science. And I graduated from Cornell in about 1982, and this was in the early 1980s when NASA was just starting the space shuttle program, so my timing was really perfect for all of this. 
NASA selects new astronauts every two or three years. They'll pick a small group of 10, 15, or 20, depending on their needs. And it was about two years after I got out of college, NASA made an announcement. They're looking for new astronauts. I was all excited. I wrote away, got an application, filled it out, sent it in. And I never heard back from NASA that time. It was about five months later. I'm reading the New York Times. There was a little article, and the headline said, NASA selects 15 new astronauts. And I saw that, and I said, well, that's kind of strange. They didn't call me. And I quickly read the article, and my name wasn't on that list. And that's when I realized it was going to be a lot harder than I ever thought it was going to be. I thought by working hard, doing my best, going to good schools, working for good companies, I would be a shoe in but that wasn't the case. I didn't give up. I decided to try again. And two years later, there was another astronaut selection. And uh, I sent my application in again. And this time, I heard back from NASA. I got a little postcard. And it started off, uh, dear sir and or madam. So you, you kind of know where we're heading with this. They said, uh, thank you very much for applying. We had a lot of good candidates. We didn't select you, but good luck in the future. And I looked at that postcard, and I thought to myself, you know, my grandmother and I have the same chance of becoming an astronaut. And that chance was zero. I wasn't even getting close in the competition. So I decided I needed to do more to get noticed by NASA. So what I did, being an engineer, I looked at the data. And I looked at who made it into the program. I had been turned down twice. And I looked into the people who were getting in to see if there were any clues there for me. And I noticed a few things. Most of the civilian astronauts they were selecting you know, had some flying experience. And I said, well, I can, I can do that. So I started working on my private pilot's license, got my instrument rating, and, and did that. I also noticed that most of the astronauts they selected had some skydiving experience. So I learned how to do that. I taught a university course. That seemed to be some experience NASA was looking for. And all these things were not requirements at all, but they seemed to help a little bit. So I thought, well, maybe I can do enough of these little things that for that next astronaut selection, they'll add up, and maybe I'll be head and shoulders above the other candidates. So I worked on all those things. Three years later, another astronaut selection sent my application in. This time, NASA called me up and invited me to Houston for a week of medical tests and interviews. And out of the thousands of people that apply for the program, NASA will whittle it down to 100. They bring you to Houston. You spend a full week on a really thorough, exhaustive medical exam. And then there's a one-hour interview. I passed all the medical exams. I went on to the interview. That went really well. And at the end of the week, I just went back to my job in Princeton, New Jersey, where I was working, and just sat there and waited to see you know, if I had made it or not. And I was back at my job for about a week when some of my friends started calling me up from around the country. And they said, uh, hey, Don, the FBI's been calling about you. And let me tell you, if the FBI's ever calling about you, it's either really good or really bad. In this case, it was really good. NASA was doing a security background check on me. And they went into my past and checked on you know, any employer that I ever worked for from high school on. They would go to my former bosses and ask them, hey, what kind of worker was Don? How did he treat the customers? How did he treat the coworkers? Did he show up to work on time? They would go up and down the streets in any neighborhood, wherever I lived from high school on, talking to neighbors and other people in the neighborhood, trying to ask about me. Was he out late partying all the time? What kind of neighbor was he? So they were looking for dirt on me. And I thought, this is a great sign. You know, I didn't think NASA could be doing this to all 100 people they interviewed. Uh, so I thought they must have made their final you know, selection. And this is the final kind of security check to make sure that you're good to go. So I was all excited, and it was about a month later, I got the call from NASA, picked up the phone. They said, Don, thank you very much for applying. We had a lot of good candidates. We didn't select you, but good luck in the future. And I hung up that phone, and I was in shock. I, I thought I had made it in, but here for the fourth time, they turned me down. And I decided I got to give up on this silly dream of mine. You know, I can never become an astronaut. I gave it my best shot. Uh, it's time to move on. And I thought, I'll, I'll go to bed, I'll get a good night's sleep, and then in the morning, I'll get up and uh, you know, put, it, put together a new plan for what I'm going to do with my career. So I went to bed that night. Uh, the next morning, I woke up, and the very first thought that popped into my head was, I still want to be an astronaut. So I asked myself, are there any more of these little things that I could do to be, you know, increase my chances? And again, by looking at who they had selected, who they didn't select, most of the civilian astronauts were already working at one of the NASA centers, and I wasn't. So I quit my job. I drove down to Houston, Texas. I got a job with Lockheed Martin, one of the contractors for NASA, uh, working as an engineer on the space shuttle program. Did that for three years. There was another astronaut selection. This is number four for me. Sent my application in. 
And uh, it was about uh, I don't know, a couple months later, they informed me, yeah, I got invited down for the interviews and the medical tests again. All, that all went really well. And then maybe a month and a half after that, I got a call from NASA. And this time they said, uh, Don, are you still interested in being an astronaut? Because we like to offer you the job. And I said something really intelligent. I said, ah, but ah, but ah, but ah, but ah. And I finally got the words yes out of my mouth. I hung up the phone and then I was jumping up and down, yelling and screaming for 10 minutes because I knew I made it. I knew I was in line to go into space. I didn't know when that would be, in five years, 10 years, 15 years, but I knew I'm in the queue. It was such an incredible moment. I was 35 years old when I got that phone call and I started a four-year training program for my first flight. So I was 39 the first time I made it to space. So what's the lesson from all this? Work hard and never give up. You know, you all have dreams of what you want to do in the future. So I just want to encourage you, do not give up on anything, any challenge that you come up across. If you don't succeed that first time, if you hit a wall, look for ways to go around over the top. Things you can do to always, you know, increase your background, to in in increase, you know, your skill set, to make you a better candidate for that, for that next go around. So never give up along the way. And I went on to becoming an astronaut, flying on four shuttle missions. This is the crew from my last flight, and the last time I was in space was 19 years ago already, aboard Space Shuttle Columbia. It was one of our Space Lab science missions. This is the crew. I'm there on the far right-hand side. You probably don't even recognize me, but that's the way I looked 19 years ago. There's a shuttle on the launch pad. I took the picture the, the night before my first mission, went out there about midnight or so, and it was so amazing just to stand there at the base of the space shuttle, all lit up as you see it against a pitch black sky. And standing there, I had incredible butterflies in my stomach. You know, I was a little bit nervous, a little bit scared, but mainly really excited because I knew in 12 hours I'm going to be sitting inside that thing blasting off. I almost couldn't believe where I was and what I was about to do. There I am. They bring us out to the launch pad about three hours before liftoff. Uh, I've taken the elevator up, standing in front of Space Shuttle Columbia there, just waiting when it's my turn to get strapped into my seat. They'll call my name and say, hey, Don, we're ready for you. I'll turn the corner to the left and walk down the access arm, and right at the end there, you see the round hatch for the shuttle. Before I climb on board, these guys in the white suits would help me put on a parachute harness. They'll do a last-minute check of all my gear, and once everything's set, I get on my hands and knees, crawl inside, and they help strap me into my seat. Once we're all strapped in, they close and seal that hatch, and then everybody moves away from us three and a half miles. <laughs> and when you realize why they just did that, that's another good moment to get butterflies in your stomach. But it's very quiet for us on, on the launch pad up until six seconds before liftoff. At that point, the three engines at the tail come up to full power. We light the two solid rocket boosters, and immediately you take off. And laying on my back in my seat, I could hear the roar of the engines. I could feel the shaking and vibration. And right at the moment of liftoff, it felt as if somebody had their hand in the middle of my back and that they were just pushing me up into the sky. And that's what the shuttle's doing, literally pushing us, tossing us up in the air. This picture's taken four seconds after liftoff. We're going 120 miles an hour already. So we don't ease off the launch pad. It's boom, and you accelerate faster and faster every second. This picture's taken from a chase plane a few miles away. You see we launch right along the coastline of Florida. This is maybe 10, 15 seconds into the launch. Two minutes into the flight, we're 25 miles up, and at this point, we're traveling at a speed of about 3,000 miles an hour, and our two solid rocket boosters have used up their fuel. They would drop off, fall back to Earth, and we'd recover those and reuse them on another mission. So in the center of the picture, you see the shuttle itself, the three bright white dots are our three engines that are burning. Off to the right, that little fuzzy patch is our big fuel tank, the big orange tank, and that's going to take us the rest of the way to orbit. Eight and a half minutes after launch, the engine shut down, gets perfectly quiet, and you're in space. It only takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. That's always amazing to me. I bet it took some of you more than eight and a half minutes to find a parking spot here around the Air and Space Museum today. And in that short period of time, you can be 200 miles above the Earth, and at this point, we're traveling at a speed of nearly 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles a second. So we orbit the Earth in only an hour and a half. On three of my missions, they were called Space Lab Science Missions, so we had a, a, a science module there in the back of the payload bay of the shuttle. Once we got to space, we'd float through a tunnel and, uh, you know, open the hatch and then work on different experiments back there. 
There I am on the right-hand side with another one of the mission specialists, you know, working on uh, different experiments. I want to tell you quickly about two of these, and uh, just to give you a feel for some of the work I did in space. You guys are all familiar with the shape of a candle flame here on Earth, and it, it comes up to a point because here on Earth with gravity, hot air rises. It's lighter, so it rises up. Cold air is more dense, heavier, settles down. And it's that hot air burning around a candle flame that draws the flame up to a point that we're so used to seeing here on Earth. Well, in space, without gravity, hot air doesn't rise. Cold air doesn't settle. So instead of a flame being drawn up to a point, in space, a flame will burn perfectly round. And what you're looking at in this picture is a little pink droplet of butane fuel, like what we have in a disposable lighter. And that blue ball or halo you see there is a flame burning. And we would light the, you know, the flame. It would uh, just burn perfectly spherical, as you see, consume all the oxygen around itself, and then self-extinguish and go out. Scientists study things like this. They're trying to understand some of the basic fundals, fundamentals of combustion. How do things burn and how does incomplete combustion, like when we have soot particles and other pollutants, how does that happen in space? Here's another experiment. We do a lot of life science experiments, and this is with a, a Japanese red-bellied newt, like a small salamander. And it would lay eggs, and we would watch how the eggs grow and develop in zero gravity. They were very similar to frog eggs developing into tadpoles. You'd see gills forming and arms and legs. And we were just looking to see any changes that occur you know, as they grow in this zero gravity environment. In space, it's a wonderful environment up there. You, know, you don't walk around like we're used to doing here on Earth. So to move around in space, just a little push with your finger, and you go sailing through the air like Superman or Superwoman. This picture is of Chaki Mukai. She was the first Japanese woman in space, and I got to fly with her on my first mission. And she's just floating out of the tunnel into our science laboratory there. This is Susan Still. She was a pilot on my last flight, and she's typing on a laptop computer there. And I want to point out one feature. You see how she's got her toes hooked on that vertical gold pole on the left-hand side of the picture? If she didn't hook her toes on that pole, every time she'd hit the keyboard on the computer, what do you think would happen? She would just float off in the opposite direction, one of Newton's laws. But if she just hooks her toes a little bit, she can float in the air and type away on the computer all day long. So space is a really fun, comfortable place to be. And in space, there's no up or down. You know, here today on Earth, we pretty much agree which way is up and which way is down. But in space, there is no up or down. And you know here on Earth, when you stand on your head, all the blood rushes to your head because of gravity. Well, that doesn't happen in space. You go upside down, you feel totally normal. And in space, wherever your head is pointed, that direction is up for you. You never feel like you're upside down. It's everybody else in the room. And that just tells you something about the ego of an astronaut, right? <laughs> it's not me, it's you. And in space, our food uh, is all freeze dried and uh, comes in small plastic packages. And people ask me, is it, is it good? And I say, well, not exactly. I would never go to a restaurant that serves space food, but it's OK up in space. And to prepare it, we have a little food station you see here. Uh, a needle will poke into the package of food. We can inject water in there. That dry, hard food will soften up and absorb that water. And after a few minutes, it's ready to eat. We just cut it open with a pair of scissors and eat it with a normal fork or spoon. For drinking in space, we drink out of little foil pouches, very similar to juice bags or juice boxes and very similar to Capri Sun juice drinks in those little aluminum bags. And in this picture, I've got a bag of uh, tropical punch. I've squeezed it, and some of it got away from me. And what looks like a little red golf ball right in front of my face is actually a blob of tropical punch. So any liquid in space forms a perfectly round ball. It's from a force called surface tension, drives it into a sphere. And it'll just float there right in front of you. You can go up and gobble it down with one gulp. Our more polite astronauts will take a straw, poke it in there, and drink it. You'll see that blob get smaller and smaller and smaller and disappear. Exercise is really important in space. As I stand up here in front of you today, I'm using my leg muscles to, to walk around to fight gravity. But in space, it's just a little push, and I float through the air. And everything is weightless in space. I could lift that space shuttle main engine over there with one finger if I was in space. So we're not using our muscles at all, and it's really important to exercise. So we had this little bicycle we'd ride every day for about 45 minutes just to get your heart muscle going, get your leg muscles working, so that when you come back to Earth, you're still in decent shape at the end of the mission. Our crews up on the International Space Station, they exercise two to three hours a day. That's a lot of exercise, but they still come back with weakened muscle, weakened bones. So we're still investigating ways to improve our exercise protocols up in space so that our astronauts can stay healthy for long, long times in space. Sleeping's a little different up there. 
we didn't have dedicated bedrooms on board the space shuttle, so when it was time to go to bed, we just took a sleeping bag, attach it to the wall, as you see here. You float up, slip inside, zip it up, and you go to bed. We wear the dark eye shades that you see over the eyes because we go around the Earth every hour and a half. You get 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of nighttime. If you don't want the sun coming in your eyes all the time, you need to wear the eye shades there. But very comfortable environment to sleep in. For cleaning up in space, we don't have a shower, we don't have a bathtub, we don't even have a sink like you have in your kitchen or bathroom at home. So we have some of those uh, aluminum drink bags that I showed you, and instead of having powdered juice in them, a few of them will have powdered soap. We could add hot water, mix up a bag of hot soapy water there, and then you know, give yourself a, put it on a washcloth and give yourself a sponge bath. That's how we clean up in space. For washing your hair, we have this shampoo that you see here called No Rinse Shampoo. And this was developed for people in the hospital who can't get out of bed to take a shower. Very easy to use, doesn't require any water. You just squirt it in your hair, work up a lather, then you take a towel and pat it dry and you're done. I took this picture, I love the bottom line on the bottle, it's a little hard to read, but it says, for beautifully clean, full-bodied hair. And just wanted to share with you what that looks like in space. <laughs> That's Susan, our pilot, and I'm not picking on Susan here, even my short hair floats all over in space. We say that every day in space is a bad hair day. I want to show you the granddaddy of all bad hair days in space, and that's right here. It's Marsha Ivan. She flew on five shuttle missions. Uh, she wouldn't leave her hair like this normally during the mission. Otherwise, for the rest of us, it would be like scuba diving through seaweed. She'd put it in a ponytail, but this is just uh, the fun and joy of being in zero gravity. This is our shuttle toilet. We've got a great one on display over here right behind me. And uh, the toilet is an amazing piece of engineering. Uh, here on Earth, we use gravity to collect the waste material in a toilet, but on the shuttle, we have giant fans in the bowl part of the toilet, and to activate the toilet, you push a knob, turns these fans on, and the air gets sucked from the toilet seat downward. So we use this down rush of air to kind of act like gravity to keep all the waste material from floating out. It's probably more than you needed to know here today, right? And looking out at the Earth, uh, looking out the windows back at planet Earth is, is probably the most favorite activity of all the astronauts up on, this, on the space shuttle program and the space station as well. Uh, it was so great just to float at the window. I've got a map in my hand trying to figure out where we are around planet Earth, and I'm looking out a window there towards the tail end of the shuttle. And I took a camera right up to that window, pressed it against the glass, and took a picture so you can see exactly what my eyes are seeing, and that's the view you get to see from 200 miles up. So in the background there, all the blue is the Pacific Ocean. The white area are puffy clouds. On the right-hand side, you see Baja, California, and the mainland of Mexico. Here's a giant hurricane. I saw many storms. This was a huge one out over the Pacific, about 400 miles across. We flew right over the top of it, and from 200 miles up, I could look straight down right into the eye and see the blue water of the Pacific Ocean. The next picture will show you the eye looking straight into it from directly overhead, right there. Just awesome to see that from directly overhead. Here's a volcano, venting steam. It's always fun to see something happening down on planet Earth. Here you see the Himalaya Mountains. And right in the center of the picture there is Mount Everest. And right there is the very top of Mount Everest. So I can stand up here in front of you and tell you without lying, I have seen the top of Mount Everest with my own eyes about 25 times during my missions. Admittedly, it's the lazy man's way to see the top of Mount Everest, but I use it to point out some of the things I got to see and do during my career. I've never climbed Mount Everest, never will in my lifetime, but I've seen the top of it many times. I've seen the Great Barrier Reef. I've seen the Amazon rainforest, Mount Kilimanjaro. So many incredible sights out the window. This is the city of Baltimore from space. City show up very gray. And this next one is, this is Baltimore near the top and Washington, D.C. at the bottom just showing you city lights at nighttime. And this is a picture of the I-95 corridor. And I put in some cities here. So you can see New York on the far right, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington. You know, it's really amazing to, to fly over, you know, the East Coast here. And you can look all the way up to Boston and just see city lights the whole way you go. And here's a sunrise from space. Because we go around the Earth every hour and a half, we get to see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every, every day, every 24-hour day. And they're all a little different. We try to see as many of those as, as you can because each one is a little unique and different. At the end of the mission, then it was time to come home. We would fire two engines in the back of the shuttle, slow our speed from like 18,000 miles an hour down to 17,000 miles an hour. And it sounds like we're going fast, but at that speed, it slows us down enough where gravity takes over and we begin our fall back to Earth. 
It only takes eight and a half minutes to get to space, but it would take us about 55 minutes to reenter the atmosphere. We do it much slower, much more gradual, so we don't overheat. And at, at the end of that, we would land at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, touch down like an airplane, and uh, deploy this big drag parachute out the back. And then we'd put the brakes on and just roll to a stop at the end of the runway, and we'd just sit and wait for them to open the hatch for us. And typically, it would take them about an hour before they could open the hatch. And when you first come back from space, you feel like you weigh about 2,000 pounds because you've been floating around weightless for two weeks, and then suddenly you come back to this pull of gravity, just a normal pull we feel in here today. My arms were heavy. My legs were heavy. I was a little dizzy, and it took about a, you know, a day or so for the dizziness to go away, and maybe four or five days to get your muscle strength back, and then you're pretty much back to normal. So this picture was taken maybe two hours after I landed on my first flight. I'm on the left-hand side there. And after we took this picture, I remember turning around, looking up, and I saw the word Columbia there. And I thought, what an amazing vehicle this space shuttle is. You know, this was my house in space for two weeks. This thing protected me from the fiery reentry coming in through the atmosphere. And then one of the next thoughts that popped into my head was, I got to do this again. And it's like going on one of those great roller coasters at one of the theme parks. You get off sometimes, you run around, get back in line and do it again. Have you ever done that? Well, that's exactly how I felt when I landed on my first mission. I just said, this was such an uh, incredible experience that I needed to do it again. And I went on to fly a total of uh, four space shuttle missions. So uh, with that, I just want to end it to uh, tell you I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing about some of the research our students are doing and, and maybe meeting some of you afterwards. I wish you all, all the best in the future. And the one message I want to leave with you again today is to never give up on anything that you're working on. That is good to become an astronaut. That advice is good if you want to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, a musician. Just never give up. This stuff isn't easy to do. It takes time to get there. It takes a lot of hard work. Uh, but in the end, it's so worth it. And when I felt that push in my back when I was taking off on the first mission, I had my helmet on, visor down. Nobody in the world could hear me. And I was screaming inside my helmet, Yahoo, let's go. And this is what you want to have in life. You want one of these Yahoo moments when you achieve that dream of your lifetime. It's such a, an incredible moment. So thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to be here today. Thank you all. Thank you. John, let's see if we can take a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, does anybody want to ask Dr. Thomas a couple of questions? Um, I have a question. Um, uh, can you see the Great Wall of China from space? Yeah, this is one of the great, uh, great myths, urban legends here. You cannot see the Great Wall of China from space. You know, it's about 35 feet wide or so, and it's built with dirt and rocks from the surrounding area, so it kind of blends in. And a good friend of mine, Leroy Chow, he was up on uh, the 10th expedition up on the space station. He was a Chinese-American, and he wanted to see the Great Wall of China, so he was up there for six months. Uh, he took great pictures of it, but he could not see it with his eye. So when you take a picture and you, and you enlarge it, you can see it, uh, but you cannot see it with your eye. You can see big bridges. You can see soccer stadiums lit up at night. You know, you, there's a lot of detail you can see with your eye. The vehicle assembly building down at the you know, Kennedy Space Center, a lot of things you can see, but the Great Wall of China is one of these urban legends that just isn't true. All right, thank you. Very welcome. During the interviews, what were the hardest questions you were asked? During the interviews, you know, it's a very friendly interview. It only lasted one hour. And they start off by asking you, so tell me about yourself. What did you do in high school? Were you involved with any sports or any student clubs? So it's, it's very, very friendly. They're not asking me technical questions about my research. Uh, some of the hardest questions they ask me, and, and this seems so stupid to me, they ask me, uh, in the morning, what shoe do you put on first, your right or your left? And I'm thinking to myself, I got one hour in here with this group. What are we doing spending an hour asking the, answering these stupid questions like this? But I realized what they were doing. They were kind of poking me. They gave me a series of two or three stupid questions, and I think they were looking to see how does he react. Does he explode and say, come on, stop this silliness? Or does he just answer the question? So I recognized what they were doing, and I just answered them. I put on my right shoe in the morning first. I'm right-handed. I just made something up. I used to paint houses in the summertime uh, for a summer job when I was in high school and college, and they asked me, do you like oil-based paint or latex paints? And I just ans ans you know, answered those questions. So none of the questions were difficult. And then they had one, uh, one question that was current events. They wanted to see if you're following what's going on in the world. 
So they asked me, the NCAA basketball championship was the night before, you know, my interview. And they said, you know, do you know who won the national championship? And I said, you know, you keep us pretty busy down here during the interview week. You know, we're busy all day. And in the evening, I went out with a group of the interviewees and, you know, had dinner together. I said, but I went back to my hotel. I turned on the TV and... I just happened to catch the end of the game, and I think, I don't know, it was Indiana or Louisville, somebody, one team was jumping up and down, yelling and screaming, so I says, I, I think they won. They checked that off, okay, current event's good. So it's a very friendly, really easy going uh, interview. Okay, so I wanna see if this is an urban legend for astronaut interviews. Do they ever ask the question, have you ever had amnesia, and the right answer is, I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Never had that question. No, because yeah. I've heard that somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, they ask you know silly questions sometimes uh, along that same line. They're they just poking you to see how you react. One of my most memorable childhood memories is waking up to a double sonic boom at four in the morning um, when the space shuttle would sometimes land at Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California, and I always wondered. Why are there two sonic booms specifically for the space shuttle? Yeah, I'm not an uh, aeronautical engineer, but my understanding, it has to do with the, the delta shape of the wing. It's got two angles coming out, and th that's what causes the double sonic boom. A capsule, you know, coming in, you know, would just give you one, but because of that delta shape, it changes angles in there as it comes out. That's my understanding of it. Thank you. Pretty amazing to hear that, too. Well, let's thank Dr. Thomas for this really inspirational talk. Thank you all very much. It's a real pleasure and, to be uh, here. And again, thank you, everybody. And